Let's try to be precise this time, not to read the, the wrong line. And she's going to discuss the uh, risk uh, for multi-asset class portfolios model internal to FACS. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Diana Vieni. I'm faxed for several years, and I just joined the team that uh, is going to support uh, the mu multi-asset class uh, risk model at Faxet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Faxet has a. a very long tradition in integrating a third part risk model. But a few years ago, we started to develop internally a multi asset class risk model. And so, um, what uh, is going, um, what we are going to see today is uh, the multi asset class risk model that Faxet uh, um, released uh, last November in uh, beta version. Um, in the presentation, we will start with uh, a, a brief overview about the model, and then we will uh, see the process uh, from the input to the risk measure. And uh, finally, we will uh, um, see some details about uh, the equity risk factors uh, used in the model. So, uh, Faxit, multi, um, Faxit MAC model is a multi asset class risk model, and uh, so the coverage uh, is, uh, is, 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 a, is a global coverage. We cover uh, equity, fixed income, commodities, and their derivatives. Uh, the model is a multi factor model that uses specific uh, um, factor for each asset type. So we have uh, fixed income factor, equity factor, currency factor, and commodity factor to identify and calculate risk for each security. Uh, the model uses a um, Monte Carlo approach uh, um, to simulate the return of uh, uh, the return and so the risk of, um, of the, the security and the portfolio, and we do this uh, uh, as absolute measure and relative to the benchmark. The nature of the model is a shorter model, so the uh, forecast horizon is one day to two, mo uh, two, two months, and the model uses uh, two years of daily data. Uh, data uh, observation are um, time weight time weighted and the uh, decay factor has an half life of six months. The model is available since uh, on a daily basis since June 2008 and there are four versions of the model available in four different currencies. Okay, looking, uh, looking at the coverage uh, we can see that uh, uh, certainly, the model does not cover all the asset class. For example, does not cover real estate at the moment, but the model is still in development. But uh, uh, for sure, it covers uh, many of them. Uh, because we use a um, Monte Carlo approach, uh, when we say we cover an asset class, it means that uh, we have a repricing algorithm to reprice that securities under different scenarios. And in the analysis, uh, equity factor returns and exposure from uh, um, a third part uh, uh, risk vendor that is R squared. Uh, R squared model has been integrated in Faxet uh, for, uh, for uh, several years. And finally, Faxet calculates uh, for commodities, uh, factor returns and exposure, and uh, for fixed income uh, spread, uh, uh, spread factor, and finally, the principal component analysis, the composition of yield curve. Uh, 48, 48 yield curves are integrated, and uh, 
uh, we consider 17 tenors uh, from one month to 30 years. Okay, so uh, starting from the time series of factors, we uh, calculate the variance, uh, the covariance matrix uh, of factors. Uh, so we uh, combine all the time series, equity factor, um, interest rate, uh, and spread factor, and commodity factor. And we used two years of daily data. Uh, observation are um, time weighted, uh, the um, exponentially weighted. Uh, the um, decay uh, factor has an half life of six months. It means that the oldest ob observation, so the observation of uh, about two years ago, because we used two years of data, um, have a weight that is six percent of the weight of the uh, most recent observation. And uh, because we have uh, a large number of factors in the model, because we, we have to cover all the asset class, uh, and just uh, uh, if we compare the, the number of facts, that the number of factors with the, the number of daily observation available, uh, we clearly see that the estimation of the uh, covariance matrix can be pro problematic. To improve the, um, the estimation, we use uh, uh, a, shrink a shrinkage technique. So, um, the goal of the um, Monte Carlo simulation process is to uh, generate uh, scenarios and then we, for uh, um, scenarios for factor returns, and then we will use this scenario to reprise security. Um, the model assumes that uh, factor return are distributed uh, jointly as a multivariate normal uh, distribution. So what we have to do here is to uh, generate uh, uh, n, um, n um, normal deviates uh, um, uh, and then we have to do this 5,000 of times. Where when I say n, n is the number of factor into the model. Um, oh, now, clearly, it's uh, quite easy to generate uh, um, normal uh, deviates uh, if they are independent, but uh, what is difficult if it is to have them correlated, and here we need to have um, the, um, uh, we need to have that the correlation uh, uh, has to be the correlation uh, specified in the covariance matrix that we calculated before. Uh, in order to do that, uh, the idea is that uh, um, we are going to um, generate uh, uh, independent uh, um, uh, variates from a normal distribution, and then we have to apply a transformation that allows them to uh, have the correlation specified in the covariance matrix. Uh, the way to do this uh, is uh, not that complex because we are talking about uh, a multivariate normal distribution and uh, we know that if we multiply um, a scalar vector that has uh, um, a normal um, multivariate distribution, we multiply on the left for, um, with a scalar matrix, uh, we um, we end up with a distribution that has a, a covariance matrix that is uh, the matrix that we used uh, times the um, scalar matrix transposed. So the problem is to decompose the uh, covariance matrix uh, uh, in a way that we have a C matrix uh, such as uh, C transposed times C give us uh, the um, the original covariance matrix. To do that, uh, um, we use Cholesky decomposition. Why? When we use Cholesky decomposition, we have uh, uh, our um, C matrix. So what we can do is now we can generate uh, um, random deviates from a normal distribution that are not correlated, and we generate uh, 5,000 of them. Then, when we apply, we multiply each of these vectors uh, on the left side for the Cholesky matrix, uh, we end up with a, a multivariate normal distribution that has precisely the covariance matrix uh, 
uh, of the uh, factor in the model. Uh, so what does the covariance ma the Cholesky matrix is to transform a set of uncorrelated uh, variates in a set of variates that are um, drawn from a multivariate normal distribution. So we end up this process with a matrix that has uh, uh, n rows and 5,000 columns. Each column is a scenario. So we generate uh, 5,000 scenario. And the role of covariance matrix here is to prevent that uh, a nonsense can be a scenario. So the covariance matrix uh, is uh, working like a filter that uh, uh, tell us which scenario is likely and which scenario is unlikely or impossible. So we, um, we, uh, we use the um, Monte Carlo simulation to generate scenario. Now we, use, we have to use this scenario to reprise security. For equity and commodity security to reprise them, we use the multi-factor model. So um, we have uh, the return, simulated return, from the previous uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And then, we, and, and then we have the beta exposure that, as we will see at the end, are calculated by a different uh, regression. And we multiply the exposure, the beta, uh, times the factor return, and so we can calculate the, return, the simulated return of the, of the asset. Uh, when we have the simulated return and we have the initial price, uh, it's pretty easy to uh, uh, calculate the simulated price for the security. So we use each of these uh, uh, 5,000 scenario to reprise uh, security. And doing that, we have 5,000 uh, simulated return for each asset. And so we can easily calculate the histogram of the distribution for each asset. Moving from equity to fixed income, the repricing process became slightly more complex. The reason why the repricing became more complex is that on one side, it would, be, I, it would be the best solution to do the fully evaluation of each bond under each scenario. But that means that we have to do the exercise that we have done at the beginning to calculate all the analytics, so to calculate duration, convexity. We did the full, um, the full evaluation of each bond. But then you have to do for each bond 5,000 times. So the computational burden of this process is pretty much challenging. To avoid that, uh, we use an efficient method that is based on the Taylor approximation of a bond price. Uh, the idea of this approach is that if we pre-calculate and store the um, sensitivity of each security, we save some time. Um, for, uh, we use different sensitivity for each, of, um, each type of risk, so to account for um, to account for uh, interest rate risk, we use uh, uh, key rate duration and convexity. To account for uh, uh, spread risk, we use sensitivity to spread. And then there is a last factor that is uh, uh, the passage of time, what is called uh, usually roll down on, on, on the hill curve. Uh, so, to reprice fixed income security, we assume that the clean price of each bond uh, uh, is a function of one side, interest rate, spread, and uh, the passage of the time. And then we calculate the sensitivity of the price to uh, interest rate. Um, we consider 17 tenors, and uh, we don't consider the, just the overall duration, but we calculate for each tenor and each yield curve the first partial derivative of the price with respect to interest rate. Then we calculate the second uh, um, 
the second partial derivatives and we calculate the um, diagonal of the matrix of all the uh, second partial derivatives of the price with respect to the key rate. And finally, we use uh, the first off diagonal uh, um, of this matrix. Uh, we tested the further uh, off diagonal, uh, uh, cross diagonal, um, cross partial uh, derivatives, but uh, the empirical evidence is that uh, uh, they are not really significant, so they are not used. So we used partial duration, partial convexity, and the first off diagonal of the matrix uh, of the uh, second partial derivatives. Um, we are repricing, uh, we are repressing the bond, and in this phase, we are focusing on interest rate. Now, um, to reprice uh, the bond, we have to, um, and we are using the Taylor expansion. So what we have to do is to multiply the key rate duration times change in uh, yield. Now, uh, movement in yield curve are pretty much correlated. So we cannot simulate all of them uh, separately because uh, clearly, because they are correlated, the, the simulation would be unstable. Uh, so we, um, we have to use principal component uh, to extract uh, the, um, uh, the relevant information about uh, yield, uh, uh, yield movement. And uh, uh, you, uh, we use uh, the, f the first four principal component, uh, the composition of yield curve. And uh, with Monte Carlo, we generate uh, a scenario of these uh, four principal component, and then we use these four principal component to, um, uh, to estimate movement in the, um, in, the hill, in the real hill curve. And we all know that principal components are pretty much accurate. Using the first four principal component, uh, you can precise about 99% or 98%, it depends on the, the particular hill curve. So uh, with, um, uh, with the Monte Carlo simulation, we have been able to generate scenario for uh, factor return, and we have used that factor return to reprice equity securities and we use the multi-factor model for equity and the Taylor formula for fixed income. So we have been able to generate a um, simulated distribution, uh, is a, a distribution of simulated return. And we have that for each security. So we can uh, derive from there the uh, distribution of the entire portfolio. And if we have the distribution of return of the entire portfolio, we can calculate all the risk measures that are commonly used in the market. So we have VAR that is telling us what happened, the maximum loss under the 95% uh, probability, the expected a loss that is going to tell us what happened uh, in the remaining 5% of the cases, and then we can uh, decompose the risk uh, in systematic risk and idiosyncratic risk. And all of these measures are available at portfolio level and at security level, and we can clearly have as absolute value relative to the benchmark, uh, as market value, and as a percentage. So, uh, now we will focus uh, a little bit more on the equity part of the model uh, to see what are the factors, the risk factors that are used for the equity part and how they are estimated. So, the equity part of the model is um, combining uh, the usability of the finite factor uh, usually in the market, the finite factor are really appreciated because they are really intuitive. With the explanatory power or st of statistical, um, of principal components, statistical factor. So the model, the equity model is a hybrid model. It's not pure factor, it's not pure statistical. The model is based on five main blocks of factor. 
So we have currency, certainly. Then we have um, country-specific active factors, and here we are talking about the, uh, the most commonly used factor in stock selection. Then we are using industry and country factor, macroeconomic factor, at, at the end, uh, uh, statistical factor, it means principal component on the residual of the previous regression. Um, one key characteristic of this model is that we are not using dummy variables to, um, to define which factor is relevant for uh, a specific security. So if we are talking about uh, uh, L'Oreal, we don't say that L'Oreal is in France, that the sensitivity of L'Oreal to, um, to currency is one for euro and uh, uh, zero for all the other currency. And uh, uh, for the same reason, we don't say that L'Oreal is um, as an exposure just on, on, on France because um, the, there are a lot of um, uh, companies at the moment that they have an exposure not just on, in the country where they are based, but they have a, a global exposure. So the, the, the model is using, uh, is certainly regressing the security versus uh, uh, its own uh, currency, country, and factors, but then is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a checking for statistical significance of all the other betas. And if they, um, if, if, they are, um, if they are significant, they are used as uh, uh, additional beta for that security. So in this way, we can be sure that each stock has a non-zero beta to all the relevant factor for that stock. Um, we were talking before about uh, uh, active factors that we say are factor used in stock selection. Now, um, uh, these are the commonly used factors, so we have value and grow, and we know that value and grow, we can have different measures for them. But if we use all of them at the same time, uh, we will have problem of instability and collinearity of the model. So what the model does is first to create a composite and then to use a composite of that measure as a factor um, in the model. And finally, how factor and exposure are estimated into the model. So um, there are two main approach time series and cross-section regression, uh, we use both. So each stock is first at the beginning is regressed versus on uh, its own currency. Uh, we do not assume that uh, um, a stock has a sensitivity to one to the, um, the, the, the currency, but uh, we regress them. And then we regress the residual of this um, uh, regression on all the other currency. We check for uh, the uh, statistical significance of all the other beta, and if they are uh, statistically significant, uh, we use them as additional uh, um, exposure. The, the residual of this regression that is clearly currency invariant uh, is used to derive the um, active factor returns. So in the first step, we we, um, we estimate beta with the time series regression. In the second step, we are going to estimate return for active factor. Um, so in each country, we run a multiple, a multiple cross-section regression uh, day by day, and we have as independent variable the stock return from one day as dependent variable the uh, composite, as we saw before, we have to use composite for some measure, or the normalized attributes of the previous day. In doing that, uh, we have 250 reg uh, regression, cross-section regression. Uh, we, concat we concatenate all the coefficient of this regression, and so we, we, uh, we can build a time series 
of um, returns, and these are the implied returns of the active factor. Uh, we use the residual of this regression as, um, as input for the next regression, and we regress uh, the residual uh, um, uh, to, uh, to calculate uh, uh, sensitivities beta to um, country and uh, industry. And finally, we use the residual to um, calculate the covariance matrix of the residual. We apply the um, principal component analysis to the covariance matrix, uh, and this way uh, we define the, we use the first um, three principal components uh, as factor into the model. Uh, thank you so much for the attention. <laughs> Thank you, Viviana. Are there any questions? Do I understand it correctly that this is a product that FactSet offers to certain customers? Yes. And who are the customers? I mean, who? Investment managers. Invest Invest yes. Is all it included in the general package you offer, or do they have to specifically subscribe to this? Is a, is, a, is a module that you have to subscribe because not, um, Faxet has a different uh, type of client. Uh, uh, we have investment banking and investment management. Usually, this is a product uh, that investment man fund manager are using. So, fund manager want to have uh, a measure. We are, we are talking about pre pre return predictability, and we start saying it's impossible to predict return, but. Uh, Regulator is asking to any fund manager to have a guess about the risk that they are facing tomorrow. And short additional question: What are the major competing products? What are similar products by different companies? The, 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 uh, this is a short-term model. Uh, the majority of the model have been uh, long-term model, and um, uh, this is uh, a multi-asset class model, the majority of the model uh, have been very focused on fixed income or just equity. Uh, this is because it's uh, more easy to do a very good job if you are taking care of just one asset class, to put all together all the different asset class and to, um, to, 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 to have something that uh, uh, works well for different asset classes, not so easy. So uh, there, there, there are other models on, on the market, but this is the first model that has been uh, created since the beginning with uh, a multi-asset class perspective. There are models that are multi-asset class, but they started at the beginning being just equity, and they added fixed income. And there are other products that they started as fixed income model, and they added the, the equity part or other asset class. So this is the no. <laughs> um, you mentioned that uh, this, this uh, model manages also uh, options, uh, both on fixed income and on uh, uh, equity. Do you approach this using derivatives as well, or you have a different approach for the option? Um, it's a uh, repricing of the option, and the repricing is not the de uh, delta normal repricing, but uh, is a repricing based on the implied volatility of the option. So it's Bavonia Adesi formula. And, and uh, so you, if you have a callable bond, you reprice it, so you cannot apply the... Uh, Taylor expansion. No, 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 no. The Taylor expansion was just uh, for uh, not not uh, not, not, not for the optional yeah. part. So you yes. decompose the bond into parts. Okay. Yes, uh, this was just an example. Uh, w when I said we are going to see the for equity and fixed income was just uh, an example. Okay. Thank you, Viviana. Let's thank again all the speakers.